Good afternoon, everybody. Once again, this is David Cerns from Haley Marketing, and welcome to today's Lunch with Haley webinar. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about staffing websites and talent engagement. And what we're really taking a look at is uh, ways to help you deal with the fact that you probably have too many unfilled job orders. And today, I'm joined by two members of our team, Mark and Jenny, and you can see they share a last name. Uh, they're going to be helping us to take a deeper look into some of the websites we're going to review and some of the ways to use social media and pay-per-click advertising to increase engagement and re-engagement with your candidates. All right, so to kind of kick things off, the, why are we here? Well, it's pretty simple. We're here because I haven't talked to anybody in the last 18 months who hasn't said, David, I've got a ton of unfilled jobs and I can't find enough talent to fill them. I mean, if you look at the December labor report, um, there were, and I highlighted it here for you, 5.8 million job openings looking to be filled in this country. Uh, you know, in a lot of the markets, we're talking to people where unemployment is back down to the 3%, 2% and less. And you know, for those of you who remember Economics 101, full employment is considered 5% unemployment. So you know, nationally, we're at 4.1% and the jobless claims just hit a 45-year low. So I know that's not news to anybody on today's call, but what we're going to talk about then is you know, how do you attract, engage, and re-engage talent? So we're going to break the, the webinar into those three parts. And the first thing we're going to talk about is, is attracting talent, which means getting them to your website, getting them to your jobs, getting them to contact your recruiters. And step one, this is pretty easy to understand, crappy jobs, crappy response. I love this picture I found in searching for something for the web webinar. But you know, if you represent jobs that aren't great, and unfortunately in the staffing industry, there are always going to be times where we have to help clients fill hard to fill jobs. Well, we are not going to get a good response unless we figure out how to present those jobs in the best way possible. Now, ideally, you want to look at how can we work with the top employers in our market? How can we get better jobs? How can we offer incentives to those employers to work with us? Because if we represent better jobs, that will attract a better pool of candidates that we can use to fill all of our jobs. Uh, maybe we offer preferred rates to the premier companies in the area. Um, maybe we go the other way and take our clients who have the crappy jobs and we use education to show them, you know, if you're only willing to pay X, this is the quantity and caliber of candidate that I can supply. But if you can do X plus 50 cents or X plus a dollar, um, here's the level of talent that we can bring in. Get market data, whether you're using the, the Career Builder portal to do that or you're using Indeed's salary analysis, get market data to help make the case that if a job is underpaying, they're not going to get the candidates they need in today's market. Or if the job itself is just not great working conditions, what else can you do to work with your clients to make that job as marketable as possible? Possible, excuse me. Um, then the last thing is teaching your recruiters to say no. I know all of us or most of us survived 2009 and 2010, and the last thing we want to do is ever tell a prospective client no. But if you have unfillable jobs, you owe it to your clients to be honest with them. You owe it to your salespeople. You owe it to your recruiters to be honest. And if the clients are crappy, like the jobs are crappy, then fire those clients. The next thing is to teach your team to write decent job posts. You know, the problem in our industry is we're going 10,000 miles an hour and we've asked people to write job posts who have had little, if any, formal training in how to write. How to write a job post, how to write captivating headlines. Your job title is your captivating headlines. How to write body copy or the job description that makes people want to respond. Uh, the old way of doing it, like Human Resources does, of writing here's our duties and responsibilities, is very focused on what you want. But in today's market, it has to be focused on what the candidate is looking for. And in, your job posts have to start off with the, you know, what's in it for me from the candidate's perspective. Now, there's a resource I want to share. If uh, you're interested in reading more on how to write better recruiting ads, we actually did a ebook um, 
a long article, in our Idea Club newsletter on how to write better recruiting ads. And so the URL you see on screen is kind of a long one. Uh, you can go to that URL by typing it in, but the easier way to get there is to go to HaleyMarketing.com, go to the freebies drop down, and right in that drop down you'll see newsletter archive. And if you click on that newsletter archive, you can then scroll back until you find the issue that was uh, dealing with the 11 ways to write better job posts. But specifically in terms of job posts, you know, what do you need to include? So first thing you need to include are things you've probably heard a lot of times before. A clear job title, something that an individual would be searching for on Google or Indeed. Um, if you have the uh, the guru of all things social media is your job title, well, no one's searching for the guru or the ninja or any of the other fun job titles companies like to use. You need to write titles based on how people search for jobs. Then the next thing in the job are the key selling points. What's in it for the candidate? followed then by the duties and responsibilities so people know what to expect and then a clear call to action. Do people apply online? Do they send you a resume? Do they call you? Can they launch a chat right from the job post? Um, we have a partnership with a company called Flash Recruit. So if, uh, if your candidates are on your website and in your job board and they don't want to apply, they want to talk to somebody, well it's one click and you get on the, the chat box with the recruiter working on that job or if they're not available another recruiter so that you can engage the candidate before they walk away but today those points that you've heard of before aren't the only things you need to think about uh, and I'm going to share some things you probably either don't or may hate to include in your job post but you got to start to think about it number one pay rate whether your jobs are high paying or low paying, having a pay rate drives more response, about 40% more response. And if you want your jobs to show up in Google search results, Google wants to see that you have a pay rate in the job. So if you don't have it, you're not gonna have your job show up as well in the Google for jobs box. The next thing, and this one is beyond super controversial in the staffing industry, is a location and not your location the location where the job is i have yet to talk to one staffing professional who likes this idea after all why do we want to tell people where your clients jobs are your competitors will go right there and try to undersell you and that's going to happen but if you want to be optimized for google google is saying you need to tell us where the job is because we want to allow people to do a job search where they can say, hey, give me jobs that are in a five mile radius of my home. Give me jobs that are on a bus route. And without the location information, Google doesn't know that. So guess whose jobs they don't show. So I don't know anybody in the staffing industry who's putting physical location in there yet. But I do know because we're in the process of uh, the Google for Jobs beta integration, Google is very insistent that that piece of data comes through. The next thing to think about is there's a lot of content to cover, but how can I do it in as few words as possible? So if ideally, if I can keep my post to one screen on a desktop or a short amount of scrolling on mobile, so it's a fast read, it's going to get more response than when I have a very, very wordy long job descriptions. And speaking of mobile, you know, the job post itself has to be mobile optimized so that it looks good on a phone. So I'm a big fan of bullet lists. They look great on desktop, but if you're using indented bullet lists, sometimes they're a mess on mobile. So think about how you're laying things out so that when you see your job on a phone, it looks good, it's easy to read. And if you're not sure, get out your phone while you're listening to this webinar, go to your website, look at your jobs, and see what your jobs look like. And think, if I was a candidate, would this tell me what's in it for me? Does it have those selling points? Does it clearly define the duties in enough detail is there a clear call to action and does it look good? Is it easy to read on the phone? And if you do all those things, you will dramatically increase the number of people clicking that apply now button. The next thing to think about is how do we increase our distribution? And by distribution, we're thinking about free distribution, pay distribution, and optimized distribution. So you know, where do you get free distribution? Number one, your website. Every job going from your ATS or manually going onto your website ideally on your domain so it's optimized. We'll talk about that in a minute. Your jobs being optimized for Google so they're going there and then taking advantage of free sites. Right now you can use Facebook for free. Uh, you can distribute to a number of job aggregators for free. 
Some of the, the big boys, the Indeed, the ZipRecruiter, and Glassdoor will take staffing company jobs. The feed may need to come from your ATS, or it may need to come from, you know, if you're a client of Haley Marketing and using our job board software, we send it to Indeed, ZipRecruiter, and Glassdoor every night. Indeed's a little more fussy about what they'll take, but ZipRecruiter and Glassdoor will take all of your jobs for free. And then there's lots of smaller secondary aggregators you can send jobs to so that they may not individually drive a lot of traffic, but in aggregate, all of these other sites will help get your jobs in front of more people. And then we think about all of the paid sites. So the Indeeds, the ZipRecruiters, CareerBuilder, Monster, LinkedIn. Depending on the kinds of people you place and depending on the geographic market that you're in, you're gonna to wanna to experiment with your budgets on these different sites. And whether you're paying per post, um, I would these days really negotiate with my vendors to look at my cost per click. And in some cases, you can buy on cost per application. So I can get a much better handle on what am I paying per person who completes a job application. The, the newest form of paid advertising, um, not that many staffing companies are doing that, is called programmatic. And that's where you use software to do your buying. So we work with a company called Recruitix, and there's a couple of other companies out there, AppCast, ZipRecruiter also offers this, that have the ability to upload your jobs or choose the jobs you're sponsoring, set the budget you want to spend, and then the software figures out which sites are going to get you the best spend. And also to do things like at what time of day do the jobs get the most response? And how many applications do you really want so we can shut off your spend when you've gotten the applications you need, so you're never overspending on the easier to fill positions. So programmatic and um, and Recruitix in particular are some things I would look at to try to do the paid part more efficiently. But the last part, I already mentioned, it's Google, it's the optimized. And with Google, you're not buying your, your way onto Google. Um, what you have to do is you have to make sure that your jobs behind the scenes have something called structured data markup. And what the heck does that mean? Well, that means that there's a structure, a, a schema markup, it's technically called, that defines to Google how your job post is broken down. So on screen, you see something called the Google Structured Data Testing Tool. So you can type structured data testing into Google and find the Google Structured Data Testing Tool, and then take the URL of one of your jobs and drop it into that box. And then you'll get the picture you see on the right that shows how Google's able to break down that job. So the sample here is actually a job that came from our website using our job board software, where it knows the job type, it knows the title, the employment type, the date posted, how long that job is gonna be open, the industry, the description, and I didn't show up the full picture here, but then it goes through all of the fielded data that Google wants. And as you can see at the top, it shows you any errors you have in how your markup is done and any warnings. So I know in our particular case here, uh, we had a warning because our salary, we actually entered it as a range and Google just wanted a single number. They didn't like that. And then there was one other warning based on just how we did the data entry. Um, Google didn't like how we did it. So we, they asked, basically were telling us with this warning, clean it up. You can test your own jobs to see, are they really optimized to show up in Google search results? And if you're not getting optimized, then you wanna to talk to whoever is providing the software used on your website about, hey, how do I get the schema markup into my jobs? And if they can't provide it, um, find someone who does or give us a call. The next thing about attracting talent is to expand the number of recruiters you're using by turning your temps into recruiters. So everybody on today's call, you guys have some sort of referral bonus program. You're providing incentives to get referrals. In some cases, you may be getting lots of them. In other cases, you're probably not getting as many as you'd like. But generally speaking, referrals are the highest caliber candidates. So you want to create a program to get more referrals from candidates. You want to make sure that it's easy to participate, that you're clearly defining the types of people you need, that you're communicating with your current candidates, your current temps, as often as you can, reminding them about the kinds of people you need and how to participate in your program. If you've got cash incentives or non-cash incentives, you wanna make sure you're promoting those incentives uh, at every chance that you get, and then you wanna make it as easy as possible to respond. 
And then you also want to think about making the program fresh. You know, if you just have the, hey, we pay $25 or $50 or $100 for a referral after they work for 80 hours, um, it's okay, but it's not fun and fresh. And if, you know, if this week um, we're doing win a great Valentine's Day dinner because it's Valentine's Day week and next month we're, we're doing a March Madness promotion, well, creating some fun and variety in your referral incentives will help more people to pay attention to your referral programs. Now, if you're looking for more ideas on how to design a referral program, we don't have time in today's webinar to cover that in a lot of detail, but we did do a lunch with Haley on 11-17-2016. You can see the URL that are all there. It's called Recruiting Insights and Innovations. And again, if you don't want to type in that whole long URL, go to, to lunchwithhaley.com. Go to our on-demand webinars, and then you can find that Recruiting Insights, or you can just do a search for Recruiting Insights, and you'll find that webinar. And you can watch the whole section on how to create referral incentives. All right, before we move on, we did have a question. You know, for the Google search, are you suggesting dropping in our URL for a job board from a, from a job board where it's posted? What I'm suggesting is you should drop in the, a job that's not where it's posted at the end client, like a career builder, Monster Indeed. I want to see you drop in the URL from your own website of the job and make sure that it's optimized on your site. Um, today, the whole Google for Jobs is less than a year old, and today, Google is giving preferential treatment to certain partners. That includes ZipRecruiter. That includes Snagajob. That includes CareerBuilder. But Google has also said, we want to get closer to the source of the job, meaning the company that's posting the job. And in the case of your jobs, you're the company that's posting it. So if your data is not marked up properly on your own website, uh, you're going to have to pay somebody else to mark it up. And if you can get free distribution on Google by having the right markup, that's what I want you to test. The next part about attracting talent is building your employment brand, making your organization a place where great people want to come to work. And so there's lots of ways to do this. I, first thing to look at is to think about just how widely are you known and how are you perceived? So if you think about in your local market or in the industry you serve, how well known is your company? When Temporary employees come in for the first time, ask them that question. Where did you hear about us? Um, before seeing the job posting, had you heard about us? Uh, what you're trying to figure out is how people perceive you and whether or not the general community knows about you. The this, this statistic, and I, I don't know if this is currently true, but was that 80% of job seekers don't think about working with a staffing or recruiting firm. So that tells me that as an industry, we don't have much of an employment brand. In your market, how do you get 80% of the job seekers to know you exist? How do you increase the power of your employment brand so that people see you as a conduit to the best jobs in your marketplace? Well, the first thing to think about is winning awards. So I did see the announcement just came out today about the best of staffing for 2018. So uh, congratulations if you're on today's call and you were a winner. But being recognized by our industry as a best place to work, a best company for treating talent is important. It's signaling to job seekers that you're a credible organization. Now, best of staffing talent probably isn't that great for recruiting. What it really does is it tells employers that we care about our people, but most job seekers aren't looking for badges from the staffing industry. They're looking for things like best places to work in your local market. So if there are awards competitions to become a best place to work, you want to be part of those awards competitions and you want to do what it takes to be seen as a top employer in your marketplace for inside jobs and for temporary jobs. And if you serve a vertical market like IT or engineering or life sciences, you know, can you go so far as to be a best place to work in your industry? It's tough for a staffing recruiting firm unless you have a big national reach, but to be a top employer uh, is critical if you want to track hard to find talent who have the option of going to you, another staffing firm, or a direct employer. If you're not the best option, they're not going to go to you. The second way to build your brand is through visibility in your local community and in your industry. Um, on screen, there's an example of one of our clients that does a lot of outdoor advertising to build their employment brand. Uh, but you can think about press releases, doing local market PR, your participation in job fairs, making sure that you're more visible, you do things to stand out at every job fair you go to. 
being more active in your local community through charity events, social events, civic organizations, professional organizations, uh, dominating social media, really having a strong Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter presence that's focused on your local market. And lastly, looking at you know, brand ambassadors, the people who work in your organization, both in the full-time jobs and your temps. How do you turn them into brand ambassadors who know how to uh, sing your praises, share your values, and help recruit people to your jobs? One of the things that's also very important is to look at your online reputation and you know, how many stars do you have? There are so many review sites that matter to the staffing industry, Google, Glassdoor, Indeed, Facebook. If you're not being proactive today about your online reputation, you're leaving essentially the how many star rating you get in the control of the disgruntled candidate you couldn't place. Because those are the people who are most likely to leave negative one star reviews. It's not the people who love you. They're busy working because you place them. It's the the impossible to place candidate that you're the fifth agency they've gone to and you can't place them either and they're going to go tell the world how horrible you are. So what we want to do is imp implement a reputation management system where we don't let reviews happen. We control the conversation. We're proactively asking people to give us feedback on how our performance was and if they're happy, we're asking for a testimonial and encouraging them to go to a review site. And if they're unhappy, we're capturing that feedback privately getting it back to our management team to help improve our service uh, or at least be able to address the unhappy candidate before they go to social media and complain. Now, the next shot you're going to see on screen is actually a client of ours that when they came to us, they had two online reviews, both one star, both from really unhappy candidates that they in a million years would never have placed. And this is an executive recruiting organization. So they said, what do we do? And we told them the same things that I just told you about being more proactive and surveying all the people at the end of a service experience and getting feedback and testimonials from people who are happy and then encouraging them to leave online reviews. And the, uh, the screenshot you see a picture of shows their website as of a few days ago where now they have 515 four and five star testimonials on their website. 4.8 star average review. If you go to any of the review sites now, there are at least three plus on every review site. In fact, we took their average one star review and had it at three and a half stars in three weeks just by being more proactive about reputation management. The next thing is looking at your website and your brand is going to be largely defined by what people see on your website. So when they show up, what does it look like? Does it tell your story the way you want it to be told? Does it effectively position you as a top place to work in your local community or your industry? Does it explain to people what you do, who you serve, and why you're different? Does it effectively sell your job openings to people? And is it optimized for SEO, search engine optimization, so it gets you found? In terms of you know, getting found, I want to talk a little bit about search engine optimization. And again, we're not going to try to do the uh, full SEO talk. I'm going to have you another resource for you here. So if you want the full hour on SEO, go to our Lunch with Haley archives and check out our staffing website SEO 2017 webinar. But some of the highlights about what to do when you do SEO, and here's the process we go through is, for, first it's on-page optimization. Looking at the pages in your website and what do we do to make sure those pages are designed and built as effectively as possible to be found in searches. And that starts with keyword research. So let's not use the words we think people are searching for. Let's start with those words, but then let's use tools, software that we can go in and see what are people really searching? What words are being searched most often? Highest popularity. Um, what are the numbers of searches being done for those words? And then how competitive are those different search terms because if a search term is very popular but super competitive, nothing we do in SEO might have an impact. So we want to find search terms that are popular but not so competitive that we can't own them. And the next thing we look at is optimizing the pages themselves, URLs, page titles, H1 and H2 tags, which means the headings on each of the pages. The body copy itself should use some of those keywords. Having internal links from page to page on your site around keywords. Creating meta descriptions, now that doesn't help you rank better, but when you're 
when your page shows up in Google search results, you want to control exactly what is said in those search results and so that it reads well and makes people want to visit that page. Uh, alt tags, so that your images have tags over them. That's important um, not just for search engines, but also if we've had a lot of people asking us questions about compliance with ADA. And if you want to be compliant, all of your images have to have tags that say what the image is so that a person who is viewing your site but, but vision impaired can essentially read the pictures. We don't want to look at image optimization so things load quickly. We want to have a site map so Google can find the important pages on your website. We want to add that structured data markup, the schema that I mentioned, so that Google knows how to read all the content. Then you're going to want to look at your developer. How fast does the page load? Uh, and lastly, we're going to look at what can we do to drive time on site. And these are just some of the factors that go into how your page is ranked. But an SEO specialist who's looking at on-page optimizations is going to walk through all of these things to help figure out how to make each page of your site as effective as it can be. And when you want to think about adding content to your website, we're going to get to content because that's big for SEO, you're going to think about the pages that describe your business. You're going to think about all of your blog posts because those are individual web pages that can be optimized. And, and most staffing companies have 10, 15 pages of content about their business. But if you write just one blog post a week, in a year you have 52 new pages. Now all of a sudden your blog is three times bigger plus than the rest of your website. And in two years it's six times bigger than the rest of your website. So over time your blog becomes the most important place for search engine optimization. Also your jobs. If you've got 10, 20, 50, 100, 1,000 jobs, you want all of that content on your site and all the things you see on screen about how it's optimized, each individual job needs to be optimized to, again, help you rank for more types of searches that people are doing. But SEO isn't just about on-site optimization. There's also off-site optimization designed to bring people to you. And a lot of what we do here at Haley Marketing Group is thinking about driving inbound traffic. And that's primarily done with content and uh, on your site and off your site. So submitting your site to directories and getting your Google My Business listing set up, having your social profile set up and linking back to your website. Guest blogging, writing on your site, but also writing for other people so it will link back to you and creating inbound links. Syndicating articles as you write a piece of content, make sure the content itself is linked back to you and syndicating it to as many other sites as possible. Now you're not gonna get SEO value on all those sites, but it's gonna generate lots of inbound links that helps your SEO because they're inbound links. But even beyond the SEO, people are on those other sites reading your content, and if you wrote good stuff, they're gonna follow your links back to your website. Press releases, PR is a great way to build inbound links as you write stories about the great things you're doing in placing people and helping people find meaningful employment and earn a paycheck and take care of their families. There's so many incredible things staffing companies do. Turn those into pr newsworthy, pressworthy stories that you can write about and then you can distribute or use paid distribution services to get them throughout the internet with lots of inbound links back to you. If you're creating videos, get them on YouTube and have them optimized because YouTube is the uh, number two and I did see a couple of people recently talking about number one search engine now. People are looking for video content, so make sure yours is out there and optimized. You can have feeds of your content submitted to other sites so that people are seeing your content on other websites, your jobs. When we syndicate jobs, that's what we're doing. We take a feed of the jobs from your website, we syndicate it using RSS, really simple syndication, to send all of your jobs to third-party aggregators and other sites. Get your team involved in social sharing. So the more you're sharing content on social media, the more people are seeing that content and coming back to your website. That's inbound traffic. And from an SEO perspective, the more social engagement there is with your content, that actually helps your SEO as well. Social bookmarking, um, using sites like Reddit where you can contribute to conversations. Again, you're not promoting yourself. Don't do that on Reddit. That will get you a lot of trouble. But sharing in conversations and then linking back to related content on your website is perfectly acceptable. 
and uh, going on other sites, whether they're blogs or forums like an ASA Central, and commenting and leaving valuable information that links people back to your site. And what you're really doing with all the ideas on this page is thinking about, I want to put my content, not just my jobs, my thoughts, my ideas, my blog posts, my articles, my ebooks, my recorded webinars. I want to put them everywhere a job seeker might be on other sites. And I want to drive them back to our website. And once they're at our site, one of the things Mark's going to help us take a look at is once they're at the site, then we can convert them to get them out to apply to the jobs. And I mentioned content. SEO is great, but content's even more important. And in fact, today, Google will tell you if you really care about SEO, SEO really is all about content. Content is the number one traffic driver. We're talking about blogs and white papers, adding regular content at least once a week to your website and information that's of interest to your target audience, whether it's your clients, your candidates, you know, if recruiting is your number one challenge, then you should be writing about the topics of interest to your ideal candidates and you should be doing it on a very consistent basis. Don't forget, jobs are content. I've said it twice already, I'm gonna say it a third time. Every job on your site, optimized. Jobs are great content to be found by search engines and to share on social media. Talent can also be content. Uh, using your website to skill market. So you see a screenshot of our talent showcase software so that we can actually take the profile of somebody looking for work turn it into content to help optimize the site to be shared on social media. Oh, and when we get an employer to the site to drive a direct placement, but also when we get a candidate to the site to so show the candidates, hey, when you're looking for work, we're gonna do more than other staffing companies to help you get placed. We've got this amazing talent showcase where we're gonna help you position yourself in the best possible way to get the job that you want. Um, and if you think about other kinds of content, testimonials, case studies, there's tons of things that you can write about. I mean, if you, even if you don't like writing blogs, call and interview clients and write it up. Do, do benchmarking with your clients to show the impact of your services and write it up. Again, that one page a week, that one post, that one new featured piece of talent, once a week, every week is 50 new 52 new pieces of content a year, 52 new pages that can be optimized, 52 pages that can be shared on social media, to drive inbound traffic by orders of magnitude more than when you don't have this constant stream of new content. All right, so those are the ways to help attract talent. But now we're gonna switch gears. Once we get them to your website, we have to engage them because if we get them to the website and then ultimately apply to a job, you know, we've spent a lot of time and effort for no tangible benefit for your organization. So your website is the secret weapon. I've had a lot of conversations, a lot, in the last 60 days with owners and executives and marketing professionals in the staffing industry, and almost everybody starts from the same place with a website. What's it gonna look like? Oh, I found this other site, I love how it looks. Let's, let's make our site look like that. The key to your website is not the design. The key to your website is the architecture. You want to design the website for response. You want to think about how the information is architected to get people to the places that they can take action. I want to think about how I can make my calls to action obvious and consistent and persistent throughout the site. I want to make it so I can get from point A to point B in as few clicks as possible so that the user experience is easy, seamless on desktop and mobile. And if I can do that consistently, I'm going to get more response. So within your website, you have an entire toolbox of things you can do to drive response. Forms, navigation, fly-ins, pop-ups, sidebars, inline calls to action. Um, we're going to go through a lot of these things, and Mark's going to take us through a few sample websites in just a minute. So, you know, forms, everywhere on your website, what types of forms can I put out there to ask people to respond? It's not just apply to a job or submit your resume. It can be a newsletter and lots of other things. You can do the forms, you can do calls to actions as fly-ins, and you'll see an example from a live site in a minute, but this shows an example on one of our client sites where we're encouraging people to submit a resume even if they haven't gone to search jobs yet. So right away, we're bringing the apply now feature to the candidate without the candidate having to find it. And the last example on screen is a, just a banner, a graphic, used to direct people to take action. And 
there's, you know, there's an adage in marketing. If you want people to do something, tell them what you want them to do. Uh, yes, it's really obvious, but I see a lot of websites where the calls to action assume you're going to find them. They assume you're going to go back to the navigation or you're going to see some text link buried in copy. No, let's make your calls to action big, bold, and make them stand out. So I'm going to jump out of PowerPoint right now, and we're going to switch gears for a second. I'm going to minimize this, and uh, Mark, we're going to take a look at a few examples of some demo sites. So um, I know we're going to start with marquee staffing, and we're going to take a look at some of the ways that they drive response. And I'm actually going to switch back to the home page, and we'll see one of them. Sure. So thanks, David. Um, one of the things that humans are really well made for is noticing subtle movement on still um, still scenes. And that's where the CTA fly-in comes in really well. On Marquee, for example, this one has a five second delay. So after all of the content loads, the fly-in comes in and it's another piece of movement on a static website. But right away, it's very well designed. It matches the rest of the site. It's eye-catching and it features a very clear call to action with a large uh, clickable area that will allow you to take that action. And one of the other nice things about it is that we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of browsers, a lot of companies being very aggressive towards ad blocking right now. Uh, Google Chrome is pushing a big update that will block uh, annoying ads like pop-ups or full screen, what they call interstitials. The fly-in will prevent that. It's not annoying, it's out of the way, and it's easily closed. Yeah, I was gonna say the other thing is that I really like about this design is that it's not intrusive. Like I, I hate the sites where it takes over your whole screen and either I got to fill in the blanks or close it here. I can just keep, you know, if I don't want to refer a friend right now. I can scroll the page. It stays there, but it doesn't block any of the other content. And if I want to close it, sure I can, but I don't have to. Yeah. And um, it's very smooth. It's well animated. Uh, it's not like Dave said, it's not intrusive. And if you want to bring it back, you always can. I know in Marquee Mark, we want to look at one other thing, which was um, using your navigation to drive action besides visiting a page. So I'll uh, show an example. So on Marquee's website, they have a lot of pages on this website, a lot more than the average staffing website. And one of the benefits of the large format dropdown is that it improves readability for one thing, just because you have so much more real estate than the traditional dropdown menu. But with this, with the additional real estate, we're able to add calls to action with text but we're not only limited to that. Marquee does a lot of this using buttons and large copy, but on other websites um, like HaleyMarketing.com, we have the ability to add widgets like short forms and uh, news feeds, job feeds. So the, the options are pretty endless. Yeah, I like, I, again, I like the design. I like the, people aren't always expecting it. Usually a drop down is just a list of the nav choices, but and you said something up front I want to reiterate. You know, if you don't have a lot of pages, it doesn't make sense to do this. But if you've got a deeper site and you really want to enhance the user's experience, um, Marquee didn't do this, but I also like sometimes people will add videos or they'll add uh, graphics and other things to really draw your eye to the call to action. So um, it, it's, it's a nice enhancement to a website because almost everybody's going to go to your navigation to figure out what they can do next. And if the action's right there, it's one less click to them contacting you, them applying for a job. It's a very flexible tool that we have a lot of options with, and it's something that's a little more rare. You don't see it on that many websites. All right, next we're gonna take a look at, we'll go to the homepage of Career Transitions. And uh, you know, tell us about uh, some of the things they do well. So Career Transitions, they did a great job of using copy and design within the actual content of the site to direct people and drive the actions that they want those visitors to take. There's plenty of white space to differentiate the different areas of the home page and the, their site in general. And the other thing that you'll notice is that the action, the calls to action are not limited to the normal square buttons that you see everywhere else. They're using colors, they're using different shapes, they're using subtle animation, and they want you to they want to showcase those areas of interest, and that makes you want to click. Just like with the fly-ins, humans notice subtle animation. And these uh, your eye will pick these up right away. Yeah, I noticed that you know, every section I scroll down, there's a, there's a box here. And it, it, what I like about it is it's not too obtrusive, but even just adding the little arrow and then the mouse over effect that it changes color, the little arrow pulled my eye to the call to action. Um, the other thing I want to I talk about is um, we talked about candidates as talent. So I'm going to actually click on this. Now, they are using skill marketing on their website. 
and they do it in an interesting way. Um, some of our clients will use pictures of people, like the example we saw in the PowerPoint. Uh, this company didn't want to use pictures, but I saw, sort of thought it was really fun. They've got all these different people in different job titles, and I can click on them to get the details of the individuals. I can see where they are, but uh, as they get hired, they change the color. And I thought this was really cool because it, it creates a sense of urgency. Is wait a minute, you know, all these people are getting hired. Uh, if there's somebody, if I need a web developer, why well, better go check out this person because he's available for interview. I can see the person's skill set, and yeah, now send me the resume. I can just fill out the form and get the resume of that candidate. So nice way to use their talent as content, but also creating calls to action right from the home page of the website. And as I said, the really clever thing to me was the use of color in this big hired box to create that emotional sense of urgency. And by not immediately getting rid of the hired talent on the talent showcase, they're showing that they do have people, they do have candidates that companies want and you should come to them for more talent. Okay, so who's up next? Um, I think we're going to take a look now at a blog example, and we're going to go to Cornerstone Staffing. What do you like about this one? So Cornerstone, they're also a big full-width site. Um, their colors are very bold. I mean, it, it's black and red, but it stands out against everything. Their blog has a longer sidebar than you tend to see on a lot of sites, but it works here because there's a lot of useful information. Um, they have easy navigation to the various categories. There's strong calls to action for the job seeker. Uh, you know what you're gonna get when you click and exactly where it's gonna go. And then for the employer, they actually include a full request and employee form. So you can get what you need right away, right from the blog page. That's really unusual. And I, I haven't checked with them on performance. So this is one of the few companies I've seen that has the entire response form built into the sidebar of the blog, um, which, if you think about blogs, and a lot of times we think about blogs as content that people get to after the fact. I go to your homepage, I go to your main nav, I click blog. But it, Jane, this may be a question for you as much. You know, what's what are the most common entry points for staffing websites? Uh, it's usually going to be the homepage or the job board. And so if you can't either capture people's attention there, then they're gone. However, the other place that is the one greatest entry points for anyone who does content marketing, they do blogging, it's a blog, whether it be the blog homepage or individual blog post. So if you have great content, that's wonderful. But if you don't drive those people to take specific actions after that, then you may have missed out on an opportunity for a job order or a great candidate you could place. Yeah, th thank you. What I was thinking about, you know, you, you, a lot of times we'll, we'll show people, hey, have your sales reps go in and share blog posts. So they go into an individual post, they go to these sharing buttons, I'm gonna share this on LinkedIn, they click the button, and what gets shared on LinkedIn is a link to that page. So if I see this story and I forgot what I'm re reading, was how can you win the morning to win the day? Well, if that's interesting to me as a job seeker and I click on it, I'm the first place I'm hitting Cornerstone Staffing's website is this specific page we're looking at. And if Cornerstone's not driving me to their jobs or as an employer driving me to apply, they're losing an opportunity to get me to engage. And what do we see most often when people design their blogs? What do they put on the blog page? They usually put a list of categories and then the dates things are published. Yeah, there's nothing better than seeing like blog posts from 2012 because that's what I want to click on instead of seeing, hey, search jobs. I also like when, when clients, when recruiting is a real priority, when they'll actually feature their hot jobs right in the side. Um, or the, the company we looked at, Career Transitions, might even have said, hey, do you want to be profiled on our website? Um, fill out our self-entry form on our talent showcase, which they would say it a little nicer than that, but they could offer that. Um, one of the things that Cornerstone does, um, and Jane, this is more a question for you. I see at the end of the blog post, they've got a, a graphic, and we show an example in the post. So what kind of impact does it have realistically, you look at data for this all the time, mm -hmm. to have these call to action banner graphics in posts? Anytime you can have multiple representations to try to drive people to a specific place, it's great. So what I mean by that is having a link in the content itself, okay, that, that's a step in the right direction. But if you really want to make an impact, make sure that you have a graphic that's eye-catching, that it directly communicates what you're going to be doing or what you're going to be getting out of clicking that. So if I read that blog post and now I know that you know I want to work with a great company, I can click on that and know exactly where I'm going to go and who I'm going to be getting in touch with or what action I should be taking. And if I could add something, having the graphic at the end of the post 
presents a natural opportunity to go to, go to a next step for whoever is reading it. Yeah, excellent. All right, Mark, before we go on to the next one, we actually had a question in. Somebody's testing as we're going. I love it. So somebody went to the Marquee staffing site and said, hey, it's got a slow load speed time. And um, Rob, you're exactly right. We show the example because we love the interaction. But that site was built several years ago, and Google has made much greater emphasis on load speed times, particularly for mobile. Um, so that is something that we're talking to clients like Marquis about is saying, okay, let's look at optimizing the home page to make it load faster. Let's look at other techniques to, particularly on mobile, to, inc to decrease load times because it is an important factor uh, in terms of search rankings. Um, we used it today, and obviously not as a speed example, but as an example of driving response and engagement once we get people to the website. But great question. One other thing that some of you may have noticed, because uh, I closed it once and now it's popped up big, is Cornerstone does one other thing. They have an automated chat bot on their website. And so what they're saying is, you know, we know some people coming to our website off hours, they don't want to fill out a form. They, they want to interact with somebody and, and they can't be there with a live operator 24-7. So they have an automated bot that can take people through some quick questions. Are you looking for a job? Okay, so we can have an interactive conversation. Have you searched the job board? No, I haven't. Okay, well, it's probably gonna give me a link to search it. Click the link below, search. <coughs> Excuse me. So with the bot, we can direct people to take the right actions, even if you don't have a live operator. Now, it's during business hours, so if Cornerstone wanted to, they could have a live operator jump in here at any time and continue this conversation. So if I click, they still have questions. They could have a live operator jump, jump in and chat with me. And that's, that's what a chat bar can do. Or if there's nobody available, they can give me a fill in the blanks, submit the form. It'll route to somebody in their office and that person will reach back out to me. So another way to create engagement from their website so people don't leave without interacting with you. All right, the next one I take a look at is wood personnel, and this was one of my favorites. This one, um, kudos to our design team, uh, was a, a grand award winner at this year's Staffing World for website design. But what I really like about wood is we had some tough challenges from a design perspective because the client had some artwork that they wanted to ensure we incorporated into the design, and it's beautiful artwork, but it didn't lend itself to the styles of most contemporary websites. But we said, you know what, let's really, instead of thinking just about the artwork, let's think about the information architecture and let's design for response. And so, Mark, what did we do to try to accomplish that goal? The first thing you'll notice on Wood, especially right near the top, there's a bunch of quick links uh, that will allow people to find what they need very quickly. And then right in the middle of the page, uh, the home page, is in a job seeker and an employer's link that will route people to the section that they need to go to. But if you scroll down a little bit, David, you'll see a quick action bar. And this is just a very beautifully designed area with a bunch of quick actions that will drive people to the areas of the site that they need to. And this includes job seekers, employers, but also general information about wood personnel and a quick link to contact them. And then on the sub pages, this continues as well, if you scroll down a little bit into the tabbed content. These also act as a quick link bar, even though all of the content is right, ready in there waiting for you. But what makes these really strong is the titles of the tabs themselves. Instead of the traditional search jobs, or instead of the traditional apply now, you have a title like skip the search, which is a little more enticing, and will probably get somebody to click a little more. Yeah, just the way the interaction happens, a little bit of animation, but there's so much I can do without ever having to go down and find, you know, go through the navigation and find what I'm looking for. It's all right here in front of me, which again, the easier you make it for the candidate, the more likely they are to respond. All right, and I think the last thing we're gonna take a look at is mobile. But we're gonna start with a company, and I just wanna show you their, the desktop version of their website, company in Chicago, and then we'll bring up the mobile version right on top. So let me, so these are the same websites and you're seeing the desktop experience versus the mobile experience. So Mark, what did we do here? So one of the things that we do with mobile is that you have to realize that high speed wireless internet is still not available everywhere. It's pretty widely available, but it's not quite everywhere yet. So we need to optimize for mobile and we give it special consideration. 
This includes simplifying or getting rid of some unnecessary content. And by getting rid of, we're not deleting, we're just hiding on mobile so it doesn't load in the first place. But you also want to make sure that your visitors on phones can get what they need to get what to to get what they need and to get there quickly. Um, this we do this through big links right front and center, as well as a mobile action bar right at the bottom, and we can drive uh, visitors to the pages that they need to go to quickly like that. And you can see right on mobile, and I click search jobs from that mobile action bar. I can actually run a job search very effectively right from here. See all the job titles. Something looks good. I can apply online. And this is very usable from a phone. And if my resume is online, I can upload it from Google Drive or Dropbox. If I don't have a file, at least I can give all my contact information that I'm interested in this job. And I can sign up for job alerts at the same time. So lots of interaction that can happen from the mobile site really conveniently uh, and effectively even from a smartphone. Okay, thanks, Mark. We're going to jump back into the PowerPoint now. So let me restart. And we're going to talk about some other ways to get people to respond, and then we're going to talk about re-engaging talent to wrap things up. So I mentioned earlier that job content is one way to get candidates to respond to you, but it's not the only way. And I'm just going to put a whole list on here of things you could consider. Job alerts, newsletters, salary guides, eBooks, and white papers. Uh, we had a brainstorming session talking about all of those silly interactive quizzes you see on Facebook. Well, the reason you see them on Facebook is because people use them. So how do you incorporate them into your website to get more engagement with your candidates? Uh, or a quiz to help figure out you know, what's the right job for you or how to, how to get paid 50 cents an hour more. Um, registering for events like webinars. Uh, you saw on the mobile version we showed of uh, smart resources a click to call feature because if I'm on a smartphone, I can actually have a direct call button that's going to launch a phone call from the website. Uh, or freebies that you can give away, a resume critique or a rewrite or a salary comparison. I mean, you can brainstorm with your team what would be beneficial to your candidates and thinking about how do we create content that we can offer people and then how do we build it into our site to have these offers, have pages where people can take advantage of the offers, and then through the navigation, the fly-ins, the, the call to action banner graphics, drive people to the pages where they can take advantage of the offers. We may not sell them on a job at first. We may need to get them back. And I know, Jenny, you're going to tell us a lot more about that in just a minute. We also want to look at entry pages and exit pages. So you know, what are the most common pages people use to get onto your website? And what are the most common pages people go to when they leave your website? So this is actually a shot from Haley Marketing's website. And, um, the, the Just Slash is our homepage. There's actually one above that, which um, we've been running a promotion um, for our all-inclusive websites. And so it's haleymarketing.com slash websites2017. It's actually been our most visited page in the last month, more than our homepage. But then when you see number four, uh, number eight, those are blog posts. And so in our top 10, we've got landing pages from promotions, website pages, service pages, educational pages, and blog pages all in our top 10. And it's important for us to know how people hit the site because we want to go look at those pages and make sure, hey, are they optimized to convert? Because if not, we're losing people. And I want to do the same thing with exit pages. And if the exit pages are leaving before somebody got to the place where they filled out a form, then I want to see what do I do to drive them to the next level where they can apply to a job, contact us, opt in for something. Because if we're losing candidates, if we're losing a significant percentage of traffic before they take action, we're giving up the opportunity to make placements with people who are already engaged with our company. All right, and I'm going to do this one quickly, but I think everybody knows it. Kill that long application form. If your ATS has a huge application that's on your website, get rid of it. Um, some of you on past lunch with Haley's may have heard us tell the story. One of our clients who had one of these long ATS application forms was losing more than 90% of their candidates. And we found that out because they were only getting about five to seven completed applications a week. We turned it off. And as a replacement, we said, let's just have people submit their resumes. In the first month after turning off the application, this company received 8,000 resumes. So go look at your application process. Have your own staff do it. Have them do it on desktop. Have them do it on mobile. If they don't get through it, 
find ways to simplify. And that goes into thinking about how to re-engineer your apply process. You know, the, the, the old way, the traditional way is I post jobs, I drive people to my website, and then I get them to fill out our application. The new way may be more steps, and some people won't like this, but it's less fall off. So what we've got is the job post. If I can, at a third party site, let them apply right there with a one click apply. Apply with ZipRecruiter, apply with Indeed. Great, let's, you know, while they're on the third party site, let's get the application. If that's not feasible, let's get them back to our website, but break our apply process into two halves. The first half is a quick apply, contact information, resume or contact information and a couple of questions. Then if we like the candidate or if we just want to make a step two follow up, we ask them to do a full application. This is more steps. It's more complicated for a lot of staffing companies. It's more work for your recruiters. But the goal is not to minimize the recruiter work. It's to minimize the candidate fall off. And this particular process is designed to get the candidates to get you their contact information, their resume with as few clicks, as few steps as possible to maximize the probability of applying. And by giving them the options, hey, apply on a third party site. Hey, just send us your resume before you, we do your full application. That gets a lot more people to apply than going straight to the last circle, the full application. And no surprise here, mobile's a big deal. Um, we actually crossed a very significant milestone last night or excuse me, last month, um, we monitor traffic on more than 500 staffing and recruiting firm websites. And last month was the first month where mobile traffic hit 51% across all of our clients. More than half of all traffic was on a smartphone. So if your search, apply, interaction, candidate engagement is not optimized for mobile, you need to update your site because more than half of your website visitors are expecting a great mobile experience. Easy search, easy apply, click to call, quick call to action buttons. You wanna add the features in and make it easy for people to get a response. All right, and that brings us back to what we're gonna do very quickly. And I apologize, um, I've been a little long-winded, so we're gonna go a little bit over. But we're gonna talk about re-engaging talent. And we've got just a few slides here, but what we found is that a candidate who comes back to your website is more than twice as likely to apply to a job as a first time visitor. So the first way to get candidates back is with job alerts. So when somebody is applying for a job the first time or searching for a job, ask them if you can send them job updates, email alerts or text based alerts, get permission, get find out what types of jobs they're interested into and then automate it. So they're getting updates from you featuring the jobs they are interested in so they can come right back and apply. But it's not just about jobs. When it comes to re-engaging talent, we're going to talk about something called re-recruiting. And Jenny, I'm going to turn it over to you since this is your area of expertise. Perfect. So re-recruiting, this is a term that we coined and came up with a couple years ago um, when we were hearing um, from staffing and recruiting firms that they were having a really, really difficult time of finding strong quality candidates that you know, they were just not out there or they were out there and we couldn't reach them or we weren't getting applications. So with that in mind, you know, we started building this idea of re-recruiting. Uh, this re-recruiting uses technology that's very similar to Google remarketing ads or those ads that stalk you around on the internet after you look at that pair of shoes on Amazon and then you see them everywhere. And it uses that same technology so that you are always top of mind. So with these re-recruiting, um, one of the first things people say, well, why don't we just promote jobs? Well, that can be effective and it definitely plays a great component. But what really takes that marketing to the next level is to think about what pain points the candidate is feeling. What are their reasons that they have for looking for a change with their employment situation? Don't just think about you wanting to fill a job. Think about why they are looking for one. So with that in mind, we really leveraged um, with all of these ads, really engaging imagery and copy that is structured around trying to appeal to the emotional um, needs that people are trying to address by looking for a new position. But what do we mean by re-recruiting? Uh, who is the audience for these ads? Really, it's a twofold approach. The first one is um, matching talent with your ATS, as well as targeting recent website visitors. 
For the recent website visitors, this is tracking technology that is when you visit a website, you get a little cookie that then allows us to show ads to your candidates. Now on the matched audience side of things, this is where you are leveraging your candidate database. On the screen here, you see a couple different stats. These are from when we initially conceptualized the program a couple years ago. But what we found by looking at over or almost 950,000 visits during a short period of time was that the people who are returning were over two times more likely to actually complete an application. So if we can get those candidates back to your website who either didn't apply when they visited the first time or maybe they haven't applied for several weeks, months, maybe even it's been a couple years, then that's awesome. Um, so what we do is we try to match those individuals based upon um, their, their contact information that you already have stored in your ATS. And then we use that information to target them across Facebook, Google, or LinkedIn. And we match them and really try to highlight these ads and these opportunities that you have available. Yeah, and Jane, one of the things that stands out to me here is just looking at the number of sessions we were able to track. So you got over three quarters of a million first time users, but 180,000 return visitors. So across all of our staffing companies, they're doing a great job at getting that first time visitor there and they're spending hundreds of thousands or millions collectively of dollars on job advertising and little or nothing getting people back. But the people coming back are twice as likely to apply for a job. Yes, absolutely. It definitely. Um put into consideration where you're investing your marketing dollars and whether you're just looking at that first initial touch point in the recruitment process or you're also trying to get those people re-engaged. Awesome, thank you. All right, last slide to talk about is marketing automation, which is just another way to do re-engagement. And with marketing automation, what you're doing is setting up campaigns and you're tracking people as they come back to your website. So the first time they apply to a job or they fill out some response form, on your website, opt in for a newsletter or download a white paper, they go into your marketing automation software. And then you can set up multi-step touch campaigns to continue to nurture the relationship on a set schedule. So the picture here shows people day one, day two, day five, day seven, day 10, setting up ongoing communications for as long as you want to with each person who visit your website to try to bring them back to search for jobs, to apply, to whatever else you want them to do. Um, you can progressively collect information from people. I've seen that as another strategy where the first time we just get their name and email address, the next time we find out their current job title and whether or not they're looking, and the next time we might find out what kinds of careers they're interested in. With marketing automation, we can create these progressions to gather information over time, but also to automate communication, staying top of mind. Now, marketing automation isn't just for prospects. It may be candidates you've placed in a referral program, or it may be ways to, even with clients, provide a training program. It's about creating a series of communication to help you stay top of mind and tell a story the way you want it told, but to drive people back to your website to get them to be more likely to engage with all of your content and all of your response vehicles. And with that said, I wanna thank Jenny and Mark for taking time out of their day. Uh, to share some great information on today's webinar. We did have a couple of questions that have come in, so I'll stay on and keep answering them for a few more minutes. Uh, if you uh, didn't get a chance to ask a question, go ahead, I'll answer it. And for everyone's benefit, we will be, uh, we have recording, we will be adding the recording to our lunchwithhilly.com website uh, by early next week. So one question that came in was about the samples we looked at, and are they all Haley websites, and how come some are HTTPS and some are not? And the, uh, the answer is, um, for years when we built websites, we didn't do secure sites, but Google prefers a secure site. The, the Chrome browser is going to tell you when you're browsing, and so will Firefox, and it's a non-secure website. It is important to be HTTPS. However, it also comes at a higher cost. So some of our clients don't want to do that. Um, some of our clients have started to migrate, and Joe, to you know, fully answer your question, I would say probably two out of every three companies we're talking to are migrating from non-secure to secure hosting because of the benefits. Also, for anybody on today's webinar who's using our job board software, if you're on our job board and you're not HTTPS, not secure, you wanna get that upgrade. It's $15 a month difference in cost. However, ZipRecruiter won't take your jobs unless you're on secure hosting. So for 15 bucks, all of your jobs now appear on ZipRecruiter. So Great reason to upgrade. Uh, another question we had was about uh, 
where do we get the metrics for entry and exit pages? And the screenshot I showed was just Google Analytics. You can actually look at uh, the behaviors area of Google Analytics and you can see the runner report of top entry pages, top exit pages to see how your site is performing. And the last question was, you know, who do you recommend for marketing automation? And Rob, my answer is I don't have a recommendation. Um, the product that we're using has some issues with the CRM, so I'm not going to name them publicly. Hopefully, they'll fi fix those issues, but we're not happy with them. I do know, they, you know HubSpot has a phenomenal platform. It's very expensive. Um, I've been, we are looking at a product called SharpSpring. We're looking at a product called Agile. A um, few different ones, but I can't recommend one at this time. I would recommend uh, checking out a variety of them to see what fits. Is it going to replace your CRM system, or is it going to just be marketing automation? What's going to be the, the setup cost? Uh, we used to be big fans of Salesforce, um, but their marketing automation platforms and the cost to get a consultant to configure them were astronomical. So we were trying to find simpler, low-cost solutions. That's where we found the one that we're on, and we found the other ones that I've recommended as alternatives. Um, sorry, I can't give you a more specific recommendation, but I hope a few choices to look at does help. And with that said, I want to thank everybody for being part of today's Lunch with Haley webinar. Um, if you have a chance, we have a demo webinar coming up next week. Uh, if you want to see what to do with social media, how we do it, uh, and how our campaigns have won Voice Awards, Genius Awards, and Best of Show Awards from the American Staffing Association, Brad Biley will be walking through our social pro services next Tuesday. And then uh, the week after next, uh, we're going to have a team of five people this year at the Staffing Industry Executive Forum. So following that on Thursday, March 15th, uh, we will be doing a recap to share what we learned at this year's Executive Forum. So if we don't see you in Miami, and I hope we will, um, then I hope we'll see you at our next Lunch with Haley event next month. Uh, from all of us at Haley Marketing Group, thank you so much for your time today.